speaker today is Espen Telexen from MLogic. Um, as I say, his title is UVVM or UVM for VHDL designers, an introduction. Um, Espen is the CEO of MLogic, who are based in Norway. He's the author and architect of UVVM, the leading verification methodology and library for VHDL. He has a strong interest in methodology cultivation and pragmatic efficiency and quality improvement, and has given lots of presentations at various international conferences with good feedback. He's also given courses on FPJ design and verification. He's located in Sweden today and handing over to Espen now. Hi, Espen. Hello, Mike. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead, Espen. We'll give yep. you a 10 minute warning as well. Okay, thank you. Good, thank you. Just try to show my screen here. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. So, yes, I'm going to talk about UVM. Uh, as it says, it's UVM for VHDL designers. Uh, just before starting, I just want to say briefly that MLogic, which I represent, is an independent design center for embedded systems and FPGA. We were established one year ago, gone from one person to 23 in one and a half years, and after the summer, we will actually be 28. Continue legacy from Bitris, for those who actually know Bitris. Um, to verification IP and methodology provider through the UVVM, so we're going to talk about today. And we also course provider, both for FPGA design and FPGA verification. So let's start. So what is actually UVVM? It's a VHDL verification library and methodology. It's free, open source for FPGA and ASIC. It's very structured, uh, so it give, gives a good infrastructure and architecture for your test benches, and definitely improves efficiency and quality in your design. It's recommended by Dualis for test bench architecture. We work tightly with ESA to extend the functionality of it. ESA is a European space agency. And it's available on GitHub and also on the IEEE open source. And it's included with various simulators. Also runs on GHDL, by the way. So this is about VHDL verification library and methodology. So why VHDL? Uh, so this is, I mean, VHDL was declared as dying, I think, 15 years ago, almost 20 years ago, over and over again. But according to the Wilson Research Survey of September 2020, VHDL is used for FPGA more than 50% worldwide. So it's definitely not dying. And UVM is sort of a UVM uh, for VHDL designers, but it has a lower user threshold, much lower than UVM. It's a logical evolution on VHDL. As a low-cost solution, you can manage with a simple VHDL simulator, and it's definitely more efficient for VHDL designers. So, as I said, it's um, <clears throat> VHDL is used a lot worldwide, and UVM is also used, used a lot worldwide. So, it's number one worldwide for VHDL application, and it's number one in Europe, independent of language, and it's the fastest growing verification methodology, also independent of language, and has a, had a huge expansion over the last two years. So let's look at the example uh, on a simple test sequencer code for UVM before we dive into the details. So let's assume that we have a very simple interrupt controller, the clock and reset, a simple bus interface to access the internal registers, and the number of uh, interrupts coming in, and resulting interrupt to the CPU. Then you want to make a test bench for that. And of course, for that, we need a clock generator. And the clock generator can get straight out of a UVM utility library just by instantiating a procedure directly in your architecture. That will be a concurrent procedure working exactly as a process. And then you have your clock generator. Then you have a test sequencer. And that's basically all you need in a simple, simple test bench. Inside that test sequencer, you'll typically do things like logging. So in QVM, you will do a log command like this. 
And in this case, it will give you a log header like uh, transcript. And then you do checking of values, of course, that's the most important thing you're doing. In this case, checking that the interrupt to the CPU is zero. And there's always a mandatory message here. You could, of course, have an empty string, but that means you'll get not get the um, sort of informative transcript that you get below here. So here I get a, a positive acknowledge on the check value. Then you can check for stability. Check that the signal interrupt to the CPU has been stable for a given time. And that's important. You can generate pulses on the interrupt sources. You can wait until a signal reaches a given value within a time window. And if that doesn't happen, it's going to time out. And of course, you can do various uh, accesses on the internal registers using BFMs, bus functional models. In this case, a simple bus interface, right access. <clears throat> All these procedures have a positive acknowledge if you want that. They have alert message and mismatch report. And of course, you can count the alerters and control the way they behave and so on. This is a simplified transcript. And if you want to look at the complete transcript, this is what it looks like. You have a prefix, then you have a message ID. Uh, that column is optional. You have the timestamp, you have the scope. The scope is to tell you or the user where does this message actually come from. That's also an optional uh, column. And then you have the actual message. At the end of any simulation, you can make a final summary of all the alerts. And then you have the pass fail criteria at the end. So the UVM utility library, which is the entry level and the sort of uh, platform for everything else, includes lots of different functionality, like the things I just talked about, clock generators, random, um, flags, semaphores, uh, verbose to control, string handling, and so on and so on. So let's go one step up and look at simple data communication. And again, going back to, uh, in this case, a UART with a simple bus interface. And of course, the UART also has an RX interface and a TX interface. This is again, a very simple test bench structure using only a test sequencer. So you can use util library and the provided BFMs. So I can use a command called UART transmit to put data into the RX of the UART device in the test. And then of course that enters into the UART and sometime later I can read it out from the uh, bus interface, software interface, SPI interface, whatever you call it, and do an SPI check, checking that from the register RX, I do actually read 2A. And then I have a transcript of that, uh, a transcript of the UART transmit into the UART RX and the SPI check, which are both okay. Then on the TX side, I can do an SPI write to the TX register inside the UART. And sometime later that will appear on the TX output. So I can do a UART expect there. And that will just wait for that um, TX or to actually enable the output. And it will get the data and check for B3. So in this case, you can see an example where the SPI write is fine, but the value going out of the UART is failing. So you get a mismatch report, an error in this case with a timestamp. It's coming from the UART test bench. You have a mismatch report saying that the value was so-and-so, whereas we expected so-and-so from the UART expect. And then a lot of free open source BFMs with UVM, Axelite, SPI, I2C, Avalon, AxiStream, FullAxi, lots of different things that you can actually use for free. And of course, quick references are provided for, for everything. Let's look, look at AxiStream in slightly more detail. Uh, again, like I look at a test bench using an AxiStream uh, device in the test, as simple as possible. So again, we have a BFM-based test bench, a bus functional model-based test bench, testing a FIFO with an AXI input and an AXI output, AXI stream, sorry. In this case, I'm going to show an example where we use something called UVM Lite, which is a light version of UVM. And it's simplified 
to give simple usage for, for users that don't really need more uh, advanced stuff. It's a subset of UVM and it doesn't have any verification component support uh, or some of the more advanced stuff. I'll come back to that later. In this case, all the BFMs for all these different interfaces are located in the same directory available from the same library. That means what we have to do in your test bench is just to include this UVM utility library, and then you have access to logging, check value, uh, clock generator, access stream, so and so. I can just put that into your test bench. There's no test harness here, again, for simplicity. So that means the sequencer, uh, in this case, has direct access to the device and the test signals. That means, again, that the BFMs from PMain, in this case, the test sequencer, can see all the device and the test signals and access them directly. And all we have to do is basically to download this from GitHub, okay, clone it or zip it, and compile it. It'll take you five minutes to get started. Let's look at the resulting transcript and debug of uh, this uh, for the access stream. Again, looking at the uh, command here, it's called access stream transmit. And in this case, of course, you have a byte array that you put in. And you can see the result going in, out, out to the transcript with the prefix, the timestamp, uh, and the uh, message. And similar with an access stream expect, you can expect to receive, uh, in this case, an array of three bytes. And the result here shows you that this uh, was uh, received as expected. Then you can actually add more info for debugging inside your test bench if something is going wrong. So for that, we can do something like something called enable log message on various sort of uh, types of messages, IDs as we call them. In that case, we can open up far more information. We can see when the packet was initiated. We can see the detailed data um, being passed in or out of this interface and when it has been completed. This is only if you enable this and want to see them for debugging. And of course, you can add similar debugging for data reception. Documentation of this BFM, uh, this is given under the UVM Light Master. Under the doctor directory, you have a quick reference, and that's similar for all BFMs. And inside that quick reference, you'll have syntax, overloads, examples, and explanations, as you can see with the access stream transmit in this case. And then <clears throat> for the BFM, we have a configuration record that uh, determines how this BFM is going to behave. Like for instance, in this case, maximum number of wait cycles, the clock period, um, and or some other stuff I can come back to later on. Configuration of protocol behavior, compliance checking, and simulation setup, and lots of other stuff. And you can use the defaults as they are in this case. And how do we compile this? Well, if again, go into the, uh, uh, UVM Light Master uh, the, uh, into the README file, you'll see there's a recipe or for how to actually do the uh, simulation. So you have uh, the uh, command there, and you can just execute that inside the simulation directory, and you're ready to go. It's that simple. But BFM procedures are not sufficient. And by the way, BFMs, as I've talked about them so far, and for UVM are defined as procedures. So whenever I talk about a BFM, it's a set of procedures. So this is what we had uh, for the UART, a simple SBI write and a UART expect, for instance. And these BFMs, these procedures are great for simple test benches. You have dedicated procedures in a simple package. You just reference them and call them from a process. Problem is that a process in VHDL can only do one thing at a time. It can either execute that BFM or execute some other BFM or do something else. It cannot do everything at the same time. To do more than one thing, we need more than one single thread. That means in VHDL, we need an entity, a component, where we can have multiple statements going on at the same time. And what we see here is a VHDL verification component. So let's look at 
what a VHD allocation component actually is. So in this case, as I said, we'll have something between the sequencer and the uh, bus interface. So we put a verification component in between. And this verification component consists of the following. It's an interpreter receiving the command from the test case sequencer, a command queue, and an executor handling execution of the command towards the device in the test. So the interpreter will look, is this command for me? If so, is it to be queued? If not, I will case on what to do. That could be, for instance, to terminate the sequence, to flush the queue, to set up something. Then the command is going into the queue, if it's going to be executed by the executor. The executor will fetch it from the queue, case on what to do. And if it's a simple bus interface, it will basically case between um, a write, a read, and a check. But you can, of course, also add more advanced commands that you could sort of case between. Then you call the relevant BFM. So again, you use the BFM towards the device in the test, but is now controlled by this executor rather than from the test sequencer directly. So how do we go from a BFM to verification component? This is again the BFM. This is the same thing using verification components. In this case, you can see that for every single interface, we have added a verification component that's connected one-to-one -one on these different interfaces. And the commands to execute uh, commands uh, towards the verification components look very similar to the BFM commands. There's only one single difference, and that's that we have to tell the system which verification component should actually handle this uh, command. So basically, you are distributing the command to a verification component. So in this case, the SPI write is distributed to the SPI verification component instance number one. And as I said, the BFMs are actually operating inside the verification components on the actual interface towards the device in the test. And these verification components can include lots of other stuff that will help you make very good uh, test benches, very good readable test benches, like delay insertion, command queuing, completion detection, uh, transaction info, and so on and so on. So let's look at access stream uh, verification component based test bench. Below you can see the BFM based test bench which I talked about a few slides ago. And if you look at the VVC based test bench, again, we of course have the same device in the test. We have the uh, verification components that are now connected directly in, onto the interfaces. In this case, onto the master and the slave access stream and the clock generator. And then we have the test sequencer, which is now not talking directly to the device in the test. The verification comes to the components. And you can, if you want to, you can include a test harness around this. And the beauty of UVM is that you can put any harness around this verification components and the test bench will still have access to them because they are accessed via global signals. So if you look at the situation, how you actually uh, make this a, with UVM, in this, uh, for this example, we're using the full UVM because we're using verification components. And with the full UVM, we get all the functionality. In that case, we have UVM utility library as a separate library, so and a dedicated library per verification component. That means we have a dedicated library for the clock generator and a dedicated library for Axis Stream. And inside those libraries, you have the relevant commands. And inside Axis Stream, uh, there's a generic to select between a master or a slave interface. And all these VIP-related functionality are in dedicated uh, VIP directories. There's a script to compile the complete UVM. So basically, you compile everything, but you only include what you need in your test bench. And then let's look at the result, the transcript uh, when running the verification components. And again, you can see the command here looking similar to the BFM command, but uh, distributing this to the verification components. In this case, you get somewhat the same type of uh, transcript or log message, 
the only difference is that the ID to the left will be slightly different and you get a message that is actually coming from the UVM and that's actually executed by Axis Tree Verification Component Instance 0. And this is just the same thing in a larger format because it's sometimes difficult to see. Um, this at the end, you can also get the ID packet complete message. And uh, you can see then that for the first message share, which comes from ID UVM send command, that's uh, sorry, it's coming from the test bench sequencer marked in red here. This command is the one that the test bench sequencer is sending out. And then the next one below, you can see it's coming from Axis Stream Verification Component Instance Zero. So this message is coming from the verification component, telling the system that this has now actually been executed. And in between there, you can get different uh, additional messages from the verification component. So this case, for instance, is telling you that byte number 493 is now finished, if you want that type of detail. And also to make it easier for debugging and to see what's happening, you can see this number six here indicating the command number. So you can see that all these uh, transcript messages belong to the same command from the sequencer. You can just get more info if you want. Then you have extra stream expect, basically the same thing. You can get the, the same command uh, log from the sequencer. Uh, of course, now with its command number seven. And of course, similar additional verbosity as for transmit. And you can have the debug messages also when the command reaches interpreter and executor. So it's really easy to debug your system. Let's look at documentation for application components. Same thing as for the BFMs, but it's this time inside the UVM master, inside the BitVisLib Axis Stream directory. You can see the uh, various uh, quick references, one for the BFM, one for the verification components. And as I said, again, similar documentation for all the BFMs, all verification IP. Again, you can see syntax overloads, examples and explanations. You can see the VVC configuration in this case. And uh, note that the BFM configuration that we looked at previously is now a part of the VVC configuration together with some other stuff. Again, you can use the defaults. To compile this complete system, to compile a complete UVM, you can just look at the getting started uh, documentation. You can see how to compile it, and then you just run the script to compile everything and use things you want. Once you have a verification component with an interpreter command queue and executor, it's really easy to extend it because it's so structured. So it's easy to add local sequencers. I mentioned that you can, in addition to, for instance, uh, read, write, uh, check, transmit, expect, or whatever, you can actually add more complex things like uh, write 100 uh, random data or whatever to make your own local sequencers that operate inside your executor. You can also add checkers and monitors and so on to your verification component adding to the value of that verification component. Just a separate uh, dedicated processes controlled again via commands from the interpreter. And one thing that's very often difficult to handle is device in the test with uh, split transaction interfaces. So for instance, with a UART and the simple bus interface, you had, you can manage with a single thread interface because everything was handled in that thread. But if you, for instance, have an Avalon interface, you first have to do a read request. And then sometime later when the data is actually available from the slave, from the device on the test, then you can do a read response. So you have to do two different uh, BFM calls from the verification components or from the test sequencer. In this case then, what we do is we just lead the uh, command from the command queue through the executor. We do the read request from the executor and put the command further down into the next FIFO where the response executor will see it. And then it will wait for the uh, device in the test to say that it's finished and it will execute the read response uh, BFM towards the device in the test. The same way it's also easy to handle out of order execution. 
So definitely more complex protocols. Uh, in this case, you just uh, don't feed the response executor with the first uh, data available, first command available, but you let the response executor actually fetch the relevant uh, command from that queue. So what are the advantages of verification components? Of course, the thing we've been talking about here is simultaneous activity on multiple interfaces. We can have lots of action going on on multiple interfaces at the same time. It's encapsulated, so you can have reuse at all levels. We can queue commands. Uh, we can initiate multiple high-level commands at the same time. We can have local sequencers. And in UVM verification components, you have some additional benefits, like you can control all the verification components in your system from one single sequencer, from one single process. And that's really unique. You can also insert delay between the commands from the sequencer. And this way, you can skew one interface on your device in the test with respect to another. And doing that, you can hit corner cases that are cycle related. And cyclic corner cases is a major source of bugs in most designs today. Have a simple handling of split transactions and common commands to control verification uh, component behavior. So that means you have the same command independent of which verification component you're talking to. And you can also have broadcasts and multicasts. And as I said, also you can have simple syn synchronization of interface actions, everything controlled from the sequencer. So you can see from that single process in the sequencer exactly how the different interfaces will be stimulated and when the different interfaces will be checked. Yeah, as you can use the broadcast and multicast, I mentioned that. So all this gives you a better overview, easier maintenance and extensibility, and far, far better reuse. So this system allows you to keep the overview for basically any number of verification components. You can have 50 verification components if you like, and you can have 10 verification components of the same type if you like as well. So basically any number of verification components. As the n number of instances as well, and you can control them all simultaneously from a single sequencer, and then you get a total overview by looking at one single file. And this is really extremely important in order to be able to, to get the full overview. Because you can ma imagine if you compare this, for instance, to software, if you have three different cores that's going to sort of operate on the same uh, functionality, it's really, really difficult to synchronize and align these. Uh, and it's, of course, going to be far, far worse if you have 10 or 15 interfaces in this case. There's lots of free UVM, VVMs, and verification components, uh, as I mentioned, with all this uh, great functionality. UVM has the largest collection of VHDL interface models available. This is a list of them. They're all free, all open source, well documented, and you have example test benches for every single one of them. So you can have, just have a look at the example test bench and copy whatever you like from there. A couple of years ago, we added uh, some more functionality in cooperation with ESA. So it's a um, huge ESA project to extend the functionality. So the most important stuff, you can see the complete list here. The most important stuff that I'm going to mention here now in more detail, the scoreboards, watchdog, transaction info, and specification coverage. So I'll, I'll look at that in, in slightly more detail. As you can see from the list, lots of other things as well has been added. So we have something called transaction info transfer, <coughs> or transaction info, sorry. And basically what we use that for is, in this case, when you see this test bench, the uh, test bench sequencer is writing something, a command to the UART application component, and that is then providing data into the UART or the device in the test. And transaction info allows the external world, the external test bench harness, in this case, the device in the test model to access the transaction info from inside the UART verification component. 
That means the dot model here can know exactly what's happening on the interface towards the UART of the device in the test, and then from that generate the expected output. We have a generic scoreboard where you have expected data going in, actual data going in, you compare that, and you have generated statistics for that. It's a generic data type, so you can have basically anything. <clears throat> you can do uh, insert, delete, fetch, it's a queue, so you can basically handle it as, as any other queue. You can, in addition to that, you can ignore initial mismatches. You can do lots of other stuff, um, provide, for instance, optional source elements, so you can get more info when you want to debug. It's counting entered data, pending data, much mismatched, and so on. It's doing, of course, logging, reporting. You can flush the queue. You can clear the statistics to start all over again. And we also have a configuration record to determine the wanted behavior of that scoreboard. So for instance, to allow data to be lost or not, to allow out of order data or not, and so on and so on. Of course, it's a quick reference point. Uh, stream scoreboard. Again, we do an access stream transmit into the master application components, pushing data into the device in the test. And in this case, we do an access stream receive uh, on the receiving end. We do not do an access stream expect because if you do an access stream expect, then the access stream slave you see will actually check the data. But now we want to do the checking in the scoreboard. So that means we just tell the access stream to receive the data. So what happens is that the uh, device in the test model will fetch the transaction from the access stream master verification component. It will generate the expected data into the access stream scoreboard. And then data is passed through the device in the test, entering out into the stream, access stream slave verification components. And then uh, the, um, this data is passed on to the scoreboard and will be matched against the expected data there. Right. So we also added watchdogs into the system, uh, basically two different types of watchdog. So we have what we call a simple watchdog, which just allows you to set a timer, extend that, modify that, and so on. And if that times out, I have finished the simulation, something is wrong. We also added an activity watchdog, which is slightly different. It's more advanced. And this activity watchdog looks at all the verification components and it times out after all the verification components have been silent, inactive for a given time, i.e. the system has been inactive. We also added something called specification coverage. If you call, some people call it requirement coverage as well. There are lots of different names. Basically what we do with that is to show that all the requirements in a requirement specification have been verified. So of course, first you specify all the requirements. Uh, and to make just a simple example, let's assume that we're controlling a motor. Um, we have requirements to acceleration, top speed, deceleration, and final position. Then we do report uh, the coverage from the test sequencer or other parts of the test bench as well. At the end, then we generate a summary report. So I'm gonna show, show you an example of this in a minute. And you might be aware that there are solutions existing today to report that the test case has finished successfully, successfully and accumulate that over multiple test cases. Problem is that reporting a test case has finished is not really sufficient. Let's look at why. Because what if multiple requirements are covered by the same test case? Like for instance, when you want to move or turn this engine or something into a given position, then we have these four requirements, right? So if we want to do that with a system where you accumulate all the tests one by one, and do a single test for every 
single requirement, then you basically have to do four different tests for these requirements. But they happen in sequence. So it's a waste of time to make multiple test cases for that. That means we want to actually accumulate uh, test coverage, specification coverage during every single test sequencer. And out of that, you want to generate various types of reports, like for instance, coverage per requirement, test cases covering each requirement, and requirements covered by each test case, and so on and so on. And of course, you want to be able to accumulate this over multiple test cases. We also added some new stuff uh, October last year. Uh, and the most important things we added was enhanced randomization, which is an advanced randomization in a simple way. Optimized randomization, which is randomization without replacement, uh, where you uh, do a weighting according to target distribution and the previous events. I'll come back to this later on. And functional coverage, which is based on the functional coverage in system Verilog, but without all the complexity of system Verilog and UVM. This is all fully integrated with UVM, but you can also use it standalone if you like. So you don't have to use UVM in general to use the enhanced randomization, optimized randomization, or functional coverage. You can combine that with anything else. It's well integrated with UVM, but as I said, you can do it with any system. This goes on alert handling and logging, right? So the good integration allows you to have a common alert handling and common logging mechanism. It's a strong focus on overview and readability. And this, this is something we try to sort of focus on throughout the development of UVM in order to have a good review, a sort of view, readability, modifiability, buggability, and reusability as talked about previously. So we add keywords to ease the understanding. So in this case, for instance, we add the keywords add and exclude to show you that the numbers 30 and 31 are added and the number seven is excluded. I'll come back to the syntax in a, in a moment. So some people then say that, well, that means I have to write more characters, right? Or write more words. Uh, yes, but typing code uh, consumes an insignificant part of the development time. It's, it's, you can totally ignore it, but reading and understanding code that's repeated, repeated over and over again, and that is a significant part of the development time. So investing in better code will yield a huge return on investment. And this also makes it easier to maintain and extend. This, First look at what we call a single method approach. That's the standard approach with randomization in one single command. And going back to what I said in the previous slide, uh, with ease of understanding, right? So simple randomization is always easy to understand. If I do a RAND function like this, I immediately understand that I'm generating a random number between zero and 18. Anyone can understand that. That's obvious. But for more complex randomization, it's often more difficult to understand what's happening and what the different numbers actually mean. But as I said, there are ways to significantly improve this. So in this case, for instance, by adding this excl um, as an enumerated, immediately tells you what we're doing. Same with the add and the same way that they do both in the same uh, command. And imagine if you didn't have this add and exclude, then you would all, always have to remember what were these different numbers, right? And maybe you as the writer will remember that, but someone who's reading your code is not used to writing this over and over again, will not immediately understand this. We have the same focus on readability also for weighting. So for instance, for that, uh, if you want to have weighting of different numbers, then in this case, we uh, extend the name of the RAND with val and weight. So you immediately understand that the first parameter here is the value, and the second parameter is the weight for that value. So zero is the value, uh, and it has a weight of two. Similar for uh, range and weight, 
then since the first keyword is or extension is range, you know that range is 0 to 18 with a weight of 4. So it's easy to understand. In addition to the single method, we also have something called a multi-method approach. And that extends the functionality of the single method approach a bit. So this shows you again the single method approach. Assuming that we want to generate two different addresses, we repeat the command, right? And we get, of course, different numbers. The multi-method equivalent for that would be to do everything sort of step by step. So we first do add range, add value, exclude value, like building up the object. This is more sort of object oriented. We build up the object, and once we've done that, we can use that object to generate address one and address two. And this also allows us to add more stuff, so we can add more ranges, more sets, more exclusions, and also future extensions is possible. Now to functional coverage. Just, just look at a typical sequence for functional coverage, because not everybody knows what functional coverage is all about, so let me try to explain that. So first of all, uh, to use this, we have to define a variable of, in this case, type T cover point. So we do that, and we just call it cover point payload size, for instance. Then we add uh, what we call bins. And these bins represent the values that you want to uh, actually use in your simulation. So for instance, in this case, we have a protocol uh, with uh, 0 to 256 bytes. And you want to check that we have used or have test cases with 0 bytes, 1 byte, 255, 256 bytes, and also some in the range 2 to 254. So for that, we add so-called bins for all these numbers. And when we tick off these bins as the corresponding payload size is used in the simulation. So that means when I generate a packet with uh, maybe a random uh, payload size of one, then I send that packet and I also do this sample coverage of the payload size. So that means I tick off that I have done, now done one packet with the payload size of one. Then I continue sending packets until coverage target is reached. And to check that, I just check for coverage completed. And by the way, UVM also has something called transition coverage. So that means we can check that you had a sequence uh, of, uh, let's take in this case with a protocol. I had a sequence of first a packet with zero payload size, followed by one with 256 um, payload size, and then going back to a payload size of zero, as one example. So then I have a sequence. Uh, transition between 0, 256, and 0. You can have long sequences and, of course, multiple sequences and check that you have actually covered these. Let's look at the reports you can get out of the coverage um, functionality because that's quite interesting. First of all, you have a cover point which is automatically named unless you give it a specific name. Then you have a coverage, and in this case, you can see you have two different numbers. One is a bin coverage, another is a hit coverage. And you can see from the example below that uh, the reason for having 60% bin coverage is that 60%, that is uh, three out of five bins, you have actually had the required number of minimum hits. Whereas the hit coverage basically gives you the number of hits uh, and includes the hits uh, for bins that have not been fully covered yet. That's why it's a higher number. Then you have all the bins. And you can also have an overall coverage report showing you all the cover points and seeing all the statistics for that. So I talked about lots of functionality now in UVM. Uh, people ask me, well, if I use UVM, um, I'm probably just locked into some kind of framework. But there's definitely no lock here. You can pick any utility library functionality. So for instance, if you want to use the await value, 
procedure because you think that's a good idea or some of the uh, flag and barrier things or clock generator you can just just use that single or multiple uh, procedures or functions and not use anything else so you can mix, mix and match with any other methodology the same with the bfm certification components if you want to use the avalon stream or the full axi then you can you can do that and not use anything else and the same of course with anything else here by the way i should also mention that the BFM certification components, they are not protocol checkers. But what we have heard from users is that they have enabled lots of bug detection. And for some of these certification components and BFMs, we have actually added some protocol checking capability. Like for instance, for the Axis stream, you are allowed to set up a random um, generation of uh, ready and not ready so that you can basically provoke the device on the test to see if it actually handles that you can of course also pick any FIFO any Q any scoreboard any advanced organization functional coverage specification coverage requirements tracking and again nothing else or combined with the things you want from UVVM so I talked about previously that we have tried to standardize uh, UVM. And so in what way do I mean that? Well, we have standardized the internal architecture for UVM verification components. Standard VVC controller checkers, standard queuing system, standard debug support. So everything inside these verification components is basically sort of standardized. And the same on the e interface, the complete test harness, have the same standard interface towards the sequencer, same protocol, command, command uh, common commands, status interface, and so on, and so on. And this means everything is getting really, really much simpler. And users know how verifications behave, uh, uh, VCs behave, and also how any test harness will work. Once they have used one or two of these verification components, they know that all the other verification components will work the same way other of course than the dedicated commands dedicated interface for that given verification component or bfm and that also means that verification components from different users will work together so verification components from two totally different companies will actually work together and that's really really nice so now let's so look at the end here at a comparison of UVM versus UVM again. Uh, first of all, we are using VHDL 2008. And we compare that now to UVM and system variable, right? So UVVM is component oriented. It cannot be object oriented. I mean, particular types is sort of object oriented ish, but you cannot have VHDL uh, object oriented. So it's going to be component oriented. But Component orientation is actually great because that's also the way we design the FPGAs and ASICs. They are all component oriented. So people know the way of component oriented thinking. Block diagrams are similar, but different naming and structure. UVM is far more comprehensive and complex than UVVM, yes, but UVM is actually sufficient for almost all test benches. And UVM user threshold is a fraction of the UVM threshold for BHDL users. And UVVM is just a step-by-step -step evolution on BHDL. You can just use the old test bench you had, the language you know, and once you sort of want to uh, uh, use a feature from UVVM, you just use that and that's one step into UVM. So it's a step-by-step -step evolution and not a totally new technology methodology. So it allows also a gentle introduction to modern verification. You may use it as a first step towards UVM if you evaluate sort of going that way. Then using UVM on the step to UVM would be a very good way of testing out the principles, the mechanism, and modern verification in general. 
But as I said, UVM is however sufficient in itself for almost all FPGA designs. And it can run on any VHDL 2008 compatible simulator. Also want to mention briefly that we do courses on uh, FPGA design and verification. Just have a look at our uh, website. We can do that. Uh, we have set up some courses in Germany. Uh, I guess most of the people here will be in the UK. We can set up a course there as well in on request. So let me just conclude here with UVM in a nutshell. You have a huge, or there is, there is a huge improvement potential for more structured FPGA verification in most projects. I mentioned this figure before, and the only way to achieve all the things that you can see in the blue rectangles here is to have a good structure and architecture. But you also have to focus on simplicity, and simplicity where it matters the most. And it matters the most in the test sequencer because that's where you spend the most of the time developing your test benches. So it's a game changer for efficiency and quality. Open source, largest collection of interface models. Uh, it's on uh, IEEE open, so open source. Uh, it's, we're working together with ESA to extend the functionality. I is working on uh, different types of simulators. And all of this has led to usage, the usage of UVM exploding. It's worldwide number one for BHDL. And you can save lots and lots of hours on a medium complex project, and of course, even more on a uh, more complex project. At the same time, you can also improve time to market, mean time between failure, and life cycle cost. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Espen, and, and, and very good timing as well. Um, just for your information, we have people from multiple countries, more than 13, so not just UK. So, um, All right. <laughs> but let's, let, let, let's go through the um, some of the questions. Um, I think possibly most of these have been answered in the, uh, during the hour, but um, I'll ask them anyway, so you can repeat that information if people missed it. Um, so does the Vivaldi simulator support UVVM? Uh, does it support, does it have, include support for all the VHDL the 2008 features that are used by UVVM? Oh, okay, I, I can properly, I can hear it properly. Uh, it was sort of does, not... does the Viva, Vivaldi simulator support UVVM? All right. Vivado. Yeah. Um, uh, we are, um, talking to uh, selling AMD um, and they are working on it uh, so uh, but at currently it's not supporting uh, uh, VHDL 2008 uh, okay. sufficiently so but we hope that will change very soon okay and that would that would be announced via, do, do you have some sort of mailing list people can sign up to to get the announcements like that uh, no, uh, but you can, I mean, I think most probably uh, silings will in a sort of inform people about that uh, through the up updates, so they'll probably get it there. Okay. But we'll put it out on the our websites as well. Okay, the next question, again, you may have answered this on your um, UVVM versus UVM. A slide. Um, but are there any concepts would you say in UVVM that could be borrowed by SV UVM uh, to to improve UVM? Would you say? If there were, sorry, I, uh, the line is. Are there not any concepts in UVVM yeah. that could be borrowed by SV UVM to make it better? Uh, as in things we're missing in UVVM or missing in UVM. Which ones are missing in UVM that, that, that could be borrowed from UVVM, would you say? I said borrowed, right, sorry. Uh, I didn't get that. Um, I think my speaker head is pretty bad. <laughs> sorry. Um, I think, from what I know, the, the concept of controlling the interfacing, being able to skew the uh, interfaces, and controlling everything from one single process from one single place to my knowledge uh, that is a feature that i haven't seen anywhere else 
So, uh, but I'm not an expert on UVM, but from the, the, the people I've talked to who at least knows quite a bit of UVM, told me that this is not possible in UVM, at least not in the same way. I think that's... It, it may not be as easy as it is the, the, that you've got, and I think that as a... I think before when you gave a talk to us, I think that's a very, very useful feature. So the, the fact that it makes it easier, uh, yeah. it, it probably is a, is a, is a big win. Um, yeah, and then, um, so the other one, the, the, the fourth question you definitely did answer was on random um, constraint verification uh, and, and I guess you're going to like this question uh, but I, I'll, I'll give you a chance to repeat this um, are there any trainings offered for UVVM? Uh, yes <laughs> I have, have a look at our, our, again. <laughs> yeah, have a look at our, our website um, mlogic uh, slash courses you'll find information there and if there's need for uh, uh, on-site courses or local courses uh, open courses then get in touch uh, if there's sufficient interest uh, we will have courses we run them anywhere I mean I've been to uh, Argentina and Turkey as well so uh, I'll travel, travel a bit for these courses <laughs> okay brilliant okay so I think we're probably going to finish there um, so we're just going to wrap up now and tell you about what's happening next so um, Disha do you want to share your screen We'll just do the final, final thank you. First of all, a big, obviously, uh, a big thank you to Espen uh, for such a good talk. Um, uh, and yeah, I think there's a, uh, as you as you mentioned, over fifty percent of FPGA designs are done in uh, VHDL or verified in VHDL. So, um, uh, and so this having this uh, UVM like for VHDL is very important for those people. I think. Um, and then there's a lot of interest in the UK around that. Okay, so first of all, thank you to us.